So the Holden model that many of you have in front of you is more fully referred to as the Youth Empowerment Conceptual Framework. You can see why we refer to it as the Holden model because it's a lot quicker and easier to say. But the actual title of this model that you are looking at is the Youth Empowerment Conceptual Framework. That full title is important to know and to understand because what it does is it indicates to us that this concept of empowerment is central to understanding the overall framework. If you don't understand empowerment, it's very, very challenging to understand the purpose of the Holden model. Empowerment is also a central concept for youth-led programs. It is, in fact, the thing that distinguishes youth-led programs from other forms of youth community engagement. What do I mean by other forms of youth community engagement? Models such as service learning, right? We're very familiar with service learning, and actually it came up at, at this group last time was, how is empowerment different? Or how is the Holden model or the work that we're doing in youth-led programs, how is that distinct or different from service learning? In empowerment-based approaches, which youth-led programs are, young people work collectively. That's that top part of the Holden model. Young people are working collectively. In the middle, it's over time. At the bottom, it's to create community change. That's empowerment. Young people working collectively over time to create community change. What's very important to understand is within empowerment, young people are critically aware of how the actions they are taking in their community are intended to create change. Do you see how that's distinct from service learning? Service learning activities sometimes can be one-time affair, right? We go and we volunteer in a soup kitchen, we come back and we reflect on the issue of homelessness, we move on the next day. It can be done independently, right? We can assign our youth to go out and engage in whatever sort of service learning project they want, and we can guide their reflection when they come back, and then we can guide and talk about their experiences, right? Service learning can occur independently. It doesn't have to occur with others. It also doesn't have to occur over time, and it can be isolated incidences. So this is very, very, very distinct from what we do with our youth when we're doing youth-led programs. Our young people are critically aware of the actions that they are taking and how those actions should affect change. And they also deeply believe that in order to create community change, they have to work with others. Leadership isn't about one person going out and changing a group's mindset, right? We know that, when, even when we look at how change has ever happened in larger social movements, right? How does change happen? There might be a leader, a representative of a social movement, right? But we know when we look deeply that it's a group of people over time who have come together to really affect any sort of change. Particularly when the change you are trying to create is this big social issue. Substance abuse prevention, <laughs> violence prevention, that's not something that can be solved by just going out and doing one educational event, right? So this is really, really necessary if we're trying to prevent the problems, at least large social issues that we're seeking to address. So we know empowerment matters. We know it's central to the framework. We know it's central to what we do. What does it mean, <laughs> right? <laughs> it's a term. And here's the issue with the term empowerment. It gets used in everyday conversations all the time. And when it gets used in those everyday conversations, what it means is confidence, right? I took a cooking class. I now feel more empowered to do healthy cooking at home. When I say that, I'm meaning that I just feel more confident to now cook healthy meals within my own home. And we hear that term all the time. That is not what we mean when we say empowerment in relation to the Holden model and in relation to the work that we're doing with young people. What we mean is very, very specific to building young people's abilities to influence social and political systems. 
to have an impact on these large social issues. That's what we're empowering young people to do. That's where we want their confidence to be, is specifically in creating changes within their systems. Does that make sense? Okay. The other thing about empowerment, and many of you have already picked up on this, because empowerment theory, empowerment is conceptualized as occurring at two different levels. It occurs at the group level, so groups can be empowered, and it occurs at the individual level. A young person, individually, can be empowered. The trick of it is, a young person cannot become empowered without participating in a group, right? Because empowerment, again, a central concept within it is that there's something collective in nature of how we create change. So while these two are separate categories, they're very critically related. What the Holden model does an excellent job at explicating is the group change, the group empowerment. That is essentially the top half of the model when you look at it, and it's some of what we talked about during day one of, in the academies, right? So group empowerment, what if we were to say, what does group empowerment look like? What, what does that mean in action? That's what the top half of the Holden model is answering for us. There are certain characteristics of a group climate and a group structure that would be indicators to us that a group of young people are empowered, that we could say that group is empowered. The Holden model details these, right? In terms of group structures, there's two very specific ones that I think we should highlight that are really most critical to empowered groups. Those are the opportunities for involvement and decision-making processes. What opportunities for involvement means is that every young person is able to take on a role within the group as their interests, abilities, and let's be realistic, time, allow them to, right? So empowered groups have roles for every single one of their members, and those members are able to step up and to lead in those roles as they so desire. Sarah alluded to this in her presentation this morning, right? There are young people, they have their strategic plan, which they all worked collectively to develop. But then the activities that they have designed, parent awareness, the newsletter, you heard the youth in the, in the video saying it, right? They work on those different activities, but they know how their work is all connected and trying to impact that larger picture. But they're allowed to become involved in what's happening at the level of their interest. Does that make sense? So I think sometimes when we think about opportunities for involvement, we run the risk of having people have disparate interests and in doing disparate things within the group. I think the work of the Ohio Youth-Led Prevention Network's Youth Council shows very clearly how we can have people engaging in different activities but still have an overarching purpose that binds the group. And that's really how we create change, right? We need those actions of different people doing different activities to impact this large-scale change that we're trying to create. But that's different than having a group of young people, one working on substance abuse, the others working on violence prevention, right? Because what, what are we focusing on altogether? So there's opportunities for involvement, but there's still a connection in the involvement in, what, in the work that they're doing. Decision-making processes are critically important as well. Empowered groups allow opportunities for all of their young people to have a voice in decision-making. So we don't just have adults. We don't just have two people making, or just two youth, making the decisions, right? In, in an empowered group, we have everybody contributing to the conversation and everybody contributing their ideas. We saw this in action when young people were developing the strategic plan and trying to decide what problem they were gonna focus on and what activities or strategies they were gonna implement to address that. Everyone had a voice in what they thought was best, but ultimately the group had to make some decisions, right? Not everyone can get their way, and that's important. Those deliberation skills are important for a young person to learn. Empowered groups also have a certain emotional environment to them. And I heard a lot about the emotional environment this morning when you all were working on your theories of change. I'll, I'll go to the one that I heard most frequently that we, we used a lot this morning, and a lot of you were using this language, group cohesion. A lot of us were already saying for our groups, we want to build group cohesion. And that's 
a fantastic goal because it is an indication of an empowered group, is that they're cohesive. What does that mean? They're friends, right? They like being, they don't have to be best friends, but they like being together. The group get, gets along. The group feels a sense of belonging with one another. Sometimes they might even correspond because they do become really close friends through their experiences in this group, so they might be corresponding outside of the group setting. That's group cohesion, and that seems like an idea that's already really relevant with this group. What's group resiliency? Group resiliency is just a group's belief that they're able to overcome obstacles. We know when we're trying to create change in our communities, when we are trying to prevent problem behaviors, we're gonna run into obstacles, right? We're, we're gonna have our challenges. The change might not work the way, the activity, the strategy might not work the way that we intended. So empowered groups have to believe that they're able to come back from setbacks. Otherwise, they try something one time, it doesn't work, the movement's over, right? Collective efficacy and outcome efficacy are ideas that I heard floating as well, and it's just kind of fancier language for it. Collective efficacy is the belief that by working together, we can create change. And I think that was present in some of the models, that you wanted the young people to know how to work together. This takes it a little bit a step further, because again, empowerment is about, about really creating these changes, that the youth buy into this idea that by working together, we can create change, that's how we do it. And then outcome efficacy is also related to this, but it's a belief that the actions that we're taking will have the intended outcome. So those are four indicators that we have for what an empowered group would look like.